Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible, both from Milligan College, as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for the day. Now, here is Dr. Gwaltney. Good morning again from us at First Christian Church in Johnson City. We're so happy to welcome you to In the Word, the study of the International Sunday School lesson for the day. And we have a special surprise for you. Uh, we have Dr. Lee Magnus back with us. He has uh, returned uh, to paradise from <laughs> somewhere up north. And they let him back uh, across the border, and we're glee. We're so glad to see you again. <laughs> Thank and, you. Uh, and it's a joy to discuss the Sunday school lesson with you. Yeah. Well, they they checked they checked my credentials to see if I'd turned into a Yankee, and <laughs> I convinced them I hadn't. So they let me back. To, well, at least they thought there Tennessee. was a chance they could maybe salvage <laughs> could, you. Could redeem me. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to be back. Uh, and uh, sure. uh, you came back uh, yeah. in the middle of a discussion from uh, Second Chronicles. Yeah, this is the second of our three lessons from Second Chronicles that we're having. So I missed the first one. Uh, glad you and Dr. Roberts were able to cover that one. I, I'm sorry I missed that one because I think the dedicatory prayer of Solomon at the dedication of the temple yes. is one of the most beautiful things in the Old Testament, and uh, it's one of the rare occasions when Solomon really got it right. <laughs> you know, he made a lot of mistakes later in his life. Well, he, didn't, he in in the king's uh, history, uh -huh. uh, he didn't come off very well. No, he didn't. <laughs> but uh, oh, his attitude toward the presence of God at the temple and the the purpose of the temple not to be the object of their worship, but to help them remember. The, God, yes. uh, I think, is, is a wonderful uh, attitude toward worship, toward wor buildings where we worship. So at any rate, we're, we're, we're still following up on that. And um, this is the next chapter after last week's lesson yes. where we see what happened after his dedicatory prayer. I think it's interesting that uh, the Chronicler's history spends nine chapters just on Solomon alone. Yeah. And most of the nine chapters are dealing with one big event, which is the construction of the Solomonic Temple. Yeah. And that's very typical of First and Second Chronicles, which yes. was originally all one book uh, in right. the Hebrew Bible, just Chronicles. That's very typical in that when, when the chronicler tells the history of Israel, he really focuses on the religious history, their, their worship lives. It, it puts uh, several things together in, in one big pot, you might mm -hmm. say, and, and makes a, 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 a very important story. First of all, there is the story of King David, uh, which arises out of chapter, I think it's seven, is it, of Second uh, Samuel. Mm-hmm. And based on that, and then, uh, so the house of David is put together with uh, the building of the temple, not by David, right. but by uh, David's son yeah. Solomon. Yeah. And then you have the priesthood, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, together with the house of David, together with the religion, as uh, the joining uh, of the true worship of Yahweh yeah. and, uh, and binding the house of David uh, together with it. So uh, Chronicles gives us a very nice holistic um, picture of the, this period of Israelite history. Yes, and it's, it's really good. Now, uh, Solomon's words at the end of this dedication ceremony are, are a prayer calling on God to rise up Yes. And make his presence known and to um, he, uh, remember his love for them. Uh, the, the last two verses of chapter 6, not in our printed text, say this. Now rise up, O Lord God, and go or come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might, 
Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. Let your faithful rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not reject your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love, your, your love um, for your servant David. So he does two things there. He calls on God to be present. Yes. And he calls on God to show his love for the Israelite people. In normal uh, parlance, um, we begin worship by calling on God, mm -hmm. even in Christian worship, mm -hmm. uh, as well as in Jewish worship. Yeah. We call on God to be present. Yeah. So what we're going to study today in chapter 7 is kind of God's response to that prayer of Solomon. Yes. where. God, Solomon calls on God to be present and to show his love to them. And yeah. God shows up. And that's, that's what we're going to read today. There are two terms in that uh, call, mm -hmm. uh, uh, calling uh, uh, upon God to be present, mm -hmm. I think are very important. Uh, one is your anointed one. Mm. Uh, and, of course, that is, out of that we get Messiah. Mm. So it's, it's messianic. Mm. And of course, all of the kings in the line of David were looked upon as being messianic um, uh, individuals. And then the second one is the term that is in the Revised Standard Version translated um, steadfast love. And we're going to hear about that more in the lesson. That is our old favorite word we've been looking at mm -hmm. in, in previous lesson, chesed. Right. And the goodness of God is also mentioned in, yeah, yes. in, in this call, in this prayer. And uh, that's going to come up That's again. also going to turn up. Right. Well, let's, let's look at these first nine verses then of chapter 7 from Second Chronicles. I'll read them. When Solomon uh, finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their positions, as did the Levites, with the Lord's musical instruments, which King David had made for praising the Lord, and which were used when he gave thanks, saying... His love endures forever. Opposite the Levites, the priests blew their trumpets, and all the Israelites were standing. Solomon consecrated the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord, and there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the fellowship offerings, because the bronze altar he had made could not hold the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat portions. So Solomon observed the festival at that time for seven days, and all Israel with him, a vast assembly, people from Lebo, Hamath, to the Wadi of Egypt. On the eighth day they held an assembly, for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days, and the festival for seven days more. Uh, in that, uh, the name of a place there in verse 8 Levo Hamath uh, uh, is um, normally translated uh, the entrance of, from the entrance uh, to the city of Hamath in Syria. Which is way up north. Yes. Yeah. In there, terms of Jerusalem, way up north. Yeah. And then the river of Egypt is way down south. Okay, and we know where that is. Mm -hmm. and, and there it is, in fact, a, a, right now, a settlement. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a, a, a really large settlement, and it's a vacation spot for Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, the Wadi uh, El Irish, mm 
mm. uh, is its Arabic name. Mm -hmm. So okay. So the point of that is that Israelites from all over Israel, as far north and as far south, had come together for this important dedication yes. of yes. the temple. Yes. Yeah. Well, there, uh, there are some things here that need ex explanation. Okay. In the first place, we know not from this passage so much, but from joining passages that we are in the seventh month of their calendar. Wait, no, see, their calendar started in springtime, right? March? Well, April? they had three or four different calendars to okay, work with. Okay, you're going to confuse me now. <laughs> three or four different calendars. Let's keep it simple. <laughs> okay. Main, mainly two. Uh, one calendar, which was a, shall we call it the spring calendar, which began in the spring, and uh -huh. then the fall calendar, one which began in the fall. Israel, in its early days, observed the fall calendar. And that's why Rosh Hashanah, New Year's Day... Is in September. Is in, yeah, is in the seventh month. Huh. A little confusing. Yeah. And uh, then um, the high holy days for Jews to this day are in the seventh month, the month Tishri, as it's named. So that's seven months counting from the spring. Yeah, counting uh, from the spring. Spring New Year's. Yeah. Okay. And you have uh, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, New Year's Day. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very special day. And then you count uh, 10 days of repentance and that brings you to Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. And then after the Day of Atonement, you have certain open days. And then on the 14th day of the month, the uh, tabernacles, or Sukkot, as the Jews call it, uh, begins. And it goes for seven days with an eighth day attached, which is a big uh, gathering day. So is that the context then for this this event? Exactly. The tabernacles. And the, uh, the yes, and the that dwelling. Was a, okay, and that was a, a big thanks, fall Thanksgiving festival right. for them. Right. So that's appropriate that giving thanks for the rebuilding of the temple would be associated with their fall Thanksgiving. And it's also a symbol for Israel's victories and the waving of palm branches and such as that. Okay, so this was a big celebration. Well, back to the beginning of our text, at the end of Solomon's prayer, call, calling on God to be present with them and show his goodness and love to them, um, God shows up. I think that's what's intended by this presence of fire and the glory of the Lord in verse 1. Yes. Fire has always suggested and symbolized the presence of God in the midst of his people, right? Right. Fire on the top of Mount Sinai mm -hmm. and fire elsewhere. At the tabernacle? At the tabernacle and mm -hmm. at the temple. Uh-huh. So the uh, pillar of fire the, that guided them in the, in the in wilderness. The desert, yes. Yeah. So uh, when it says fire came down from heaven, the main suggestion there is that God's presence is is sense that, that well is another made. example of fire coming down uh, in the book of Judges we have an uh, offering set up uh, in uh, for one of the judges Gideon mm. and uh, fire devoured the offering that he had mm -hmm. and then in the story in the book of Kings where you have Elijah on uh, Mount Carmel mm -hmm. um, and uh, as a sign of uh, you might say, confirming Elijah yeah. as the true prophet of God, fire came down and uh, burned up the offering on, uh, that, that he had prepared. Okay. Uh, while it, nothing happened to the offering yeah. the priests of Baal had made. So that suggests both that God is really present um, and a, a sense of approval as validation of well, his yeah, prophet. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can't help but remembering the day of Pentecost uh, that's mentioned in Acts chapter 2 uh, where yes. something that looked like fire indicates that God's spiritual presence uh, 
is is with them. Tongues of fire. Yeah. Which is a way of saying the tongues show the power of God in speech mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, apostles. Yeah. So, uh, the fire from heaven suggests the presence and power of God. And then there's this phrase, the glory of the Lord, which shows up three times here in a couple of verses. The yes. glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter because of the glory of the Lord. All Israel saw the fire and the glory of the Lord. So, that's really emphasized. What, what should we be thinking about when we see this phrase, glory of the Lord? Uh, well, again, once again, we, we're exposed to the idea of the pillar of fire and smoke that led Israel through the desert. Hmm. And they were supposed to pick up and move when that pillar of uh, hmm. fire and smoke moved because that uh, was a reference to the, the leading and direction of, of God for hmm. them. And um, consequently, um, God was with them okay. in what was going on here. Mm -hmm. So both the fire and the, this phrase, glory of the Lord, Are uh, tired? together suggest the, the yeah. presence of God in the midst of his people. That's right. And that's how he led them. Yeah. Now, um, when they reach the Holy Land... Uh, the the uh, shrine where they worship uh, was still a tent mm -hmm. and and an op an open air place mm -hmm. where sacrifices were altered, offered mm -hmm. to God. Then, when later Solomon is commissioned to build this very sanctuary we're talking about, in the courtyard there is an altar where there are sacrifices made twice a day. And, and at other times um, on holy occasions. And that uh, meant that it was on elevated ground. So as the night uh, began to darken, uh, then there would be a glow. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the day there would be smoke Mm -hmm. And um, what this amounted to was what they referred to as the Shekinah, the Shekinah mm -hmm. uh, of God's presence. In other words, the dwelling of God among his people. Okay. And it's indicated by fire and smoke. Yeah. And every time they turned and looked in that direction and saw the smoke from the uh, altar of burnt offering, uh, they were reminded God is here with us. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing that's important about these opening verses is the response of the Israelite people to uh, this, these symbols of God's presence in their midst. Um, and their response, I think I could sum up, is reverence, right? Um, Absolutely. Worship. worship. Uh, phys physical suggestion of reverence, this kneeling and bowing to the ground, and then uh, these these words, they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord. Yeah, and I think it ought to be, uh, let's ask the question. When uh, the Old Testament uses the terminology worship, mm -hmm. what does it entail? And uh, it's a very... Um, Descriptive word, it means prostrating yourself uh, on your face. Hmm. Which is literally what these people did on this occasion. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There is kneeling and then there is prostration. Uh -huh. And uh, what, this is, what you're doing is when you appeared before uh, a king or a person who has power over you, life and death power over you. Mm -hmm. You threw yourself on the ground in such a way as to say, here I am, I am at your mercy, mm -hmm. and uh, I am asking for your grace. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an act of, um, of reverence. It's also an act of submission Yes, to do that. And yeah. asking for mercy. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of mercy, that's one of the ways to translate the word love, uh, uh, because what they, uh, 
what they were singing out uh, is quoted here for us. He, that is Yahweh, is good. His love endures forever. That refrain yes. uh, shows up all over the Old Testament, doesn't it? it especially, especially in Psalms. In Psalms, yeah. Well, uh, there uh, was a very excellent scholar of the Psalms, uh, Klaus Westermann, who taught at Heidelberg, and uh, he made the point. The, the Psalter, the book of Psalms, can be summarized under two headings, thanks and praise. Hmm. And uh, that's what, what it's all about. Yeah. And those two concepts are joined in this passage. In fact, those two words show up uh, down in verse 6 uh, when the musical instruments uh, are, are called in. These were the instruments that David had made for praising the Lord and for the purpose of giving thanks. Yes. So there, there it is, praise and thanks. Now, the interesting thing is that the book of Psalms d does not bear the name thanks. Uh, the name of the book of Psalms is praises. Mm. But the word thanks shows up at the beginning of many of the psalms. Oh, absolutely. And there are many psalms absolutely. of thanksgiving. Right. You know, give thanks to the Lord for now, he is good. Uh, by the way, we now need, need to point out that uh, what, what is being referred to here is Psalm 136. Where these words become like a refrain all the way through all that psalm. All the way through the psalm, yeah. yeah. And the first uh, verse of it uh, is... Um, Hodu Ladonai Kitov in Hebrew, give uh, thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Okay. Ki uh, Le'olam Chasdo is the latter part of the verse, for his Hesed endures forever. Okay. And we've talked about Hesed before, but just as a quick reminder, this suggests God's abiding covenant love for his people, which God expects yep. them to return because a covenant is, a, is an agreement. Um, and it's one God the, keeps covenant and he wishes Israel to keep covenant yeah. with him yeah. and with one another. Right. And so that, that word is kind of, that, that concept is kind of gathered up under the rubric of this word chesed, which gets translated um, love, steadfast love, mercy, and King James, loving kindness. Or it, it's hard to pin I, down. I count <laughs> over, over 20 different <laughs> words, terms. Trying, different English ways of trying to translate, uh, translate that, that word. one word yeah. with two syllables. So uh, <coughs> we, we might uh, suggest to our viewers that they, uh, when they get a chance, look at that Psalm 136, where they see these, these concepts of the goodness of God, the mercy of God, um, showing up <clears throat> over and over again. Among and, other things, that psalm dwells on the nature of God as creator. Yeah. One of the fascinating things to me is that this refrain, these words right here, show up again in Ezra at the time of the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian captivity. Right. They evidently remembered uh, yeah. or had recorded these words that were said or sung at the dedication of the first temple. Yes. And now they echo them again yeah. at the dedication of the second. Well, uh, this begins then a period of, of animal sacrifices and grain sacrifices. Uh, there are different kinds of sacrifices here. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could run through them quickly. Uh, the first kind that's mentioned is um, whole uh, burnt offerings. And th this would be in reference to all the animals that are talked about in right. verse 5. And then the phrase is burnt offerings in verse 7. Uh, because in the word there indicates the, uh, the sacrifice goes up. Mm -hmm. the and, and that is it's burned. Burned up. Yeah. And it... And it uh, it goes yeah. up yeah. To the, toward the sky, yeah. which means that 
it is meant for God only. Then the second one is called fellowship offerings here, sometimes called peace offerings. Yeah, and, and I understand why that the confusion. Uh, it, what it means is, and the way it's described in, in the book of Leviticus, is that p parts of the animal, uh, you know, it, it's slaughtered and divided up into uh, pieces. Part of the pieces are put on the altar to be burned. Part of the pieces are given to the priests and Levites for their sustenance. And part of the pieces are to be cooked by the worshiping family. So it's kind of a communal meal involving the presiding priest, the, the worshipers, and God. Exactly. And In other words, God, the clergy, and the worshiping mm -hmm. family are joined together in this uh, particular uh, and, uh, type of sacrifice. Could, could be viewed as a foreshadowing uh, of communion. Exactly. Lord's Supper. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then, it is a meal to be eaten. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then the third kind is the grain offering mentioned at the end of verse 7. Uh, sometimes that, That's an attachment to uh, any meal. Okay. And, yeah. That was sometimes called a cereal offering. Yes. And some, that used to confuse me when I was a kid. I thought it meant, you know, Rice Krispies or something like that. But it, <laughs> no. it, it means grains. It doesn't. Yeah. Grains. In the form of bread or yeah. just yeah. the grain. Uh, well, we've already talked about the last few verses where it says, All of Israel from the far north to the far south gathered together to celebrate the dedication of this temple and the Feast of Tabernacles in one grand a, a One festival. quick thing to add on. What, mm -hmm. what is the word to dedicate or consecrate? Mm -hmm. And it is that, ver that very broad word to make holy, mm -hmm. to sanctify, mm -hmm. to set aside. Good. For a holy purpose. Yeah. That's the word at the beginning of verse 7, Solomon consecrated. Yeah, and yeah. dedicated. Yeah. I wanted to mention, uh, as we wrap up here, that um, even though, you know, we don't build temples and things like that, uh, the focus of this passage is on God and the nature of God and the, our reverence toward God. Yes. And there are just a few things here that I think we can take away and apply as Christians as well. For one thing, God is a present God. God's glory is present among us, and that's worth exactly. celebrating. Yes. And the goodness of God is emphasized here. Our God is good, yes. uh, no matter the circumstances. And merciful. And, and this hesed idea of mercy yes. and his steadfast love. And God is worthy of worship, and we just need to remember that. I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that the next verse that isn't printed here says that Solomon dismissed them to their homes, joyful and in good spirits because of the goodness of the Lord. And I would like to think that we could take, uh, take joy in our worship of the Lord this day. True worship leads to joy. Leads to joy. Uh, I hope it would be true of us as well. Yes. Yeah, good. So we Christians can learn something from this Old Testament text after all, yeah, and uh, we're glad you could be with us. And we have one more lesson with a very familiar verse in it. So come back and join us next week, and uh, we wish you uh, a very good and uh, peaceful uh, week to this week. This has been In the Word. A study of the International Bible School lesson with Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible from Milligan College, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible of Milligan College. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School lesson text. This has been a production of the First Christian Church Television Ministries.